on today's Run to the Top podcast. Everyone who's a beginner is, is as nervous as you are about their ability. And without a doubt, the people who make the strongest athletes in triathlon come from a running background. Because the run is at the end of the triathlon, it is traditionally the hardest part of the race. And if someone's a swimmer or a biker, I can absolutely guarantee that they're dreading the run part of it. Mm-hmm. And if you're a runner coming into the sport, if you look at the race in, in general, if you can be fast when the race is slow, the whole of that final section, the whole of the run event, you're in a, a positive mental attitude of, I'm passing people and I seem to be doing better than other people here. Welcome to the Run to the Top podcast from Runners Connect, where it's all about learning from the best and most inspiring minds in the sport. Together, we can train a smarter, healthier, and faster running community. Now here's your host, Tina Muir. Hello, this is Tina Muir. Thank you so much for joining me for the latest episode of the Run to the Top podcast brought to you by Runners Connect. So last week we talked to Lani Marchant, who is setting up her legacy in the world of running by helping runners all over the world to be confident about their running bodies. And it was a really powerful episode. And that girl is not afraid to speak her mind and stand up for what she thinks is right, which is so admirable. As for today, if you've been running for a while, you might have considered trying something new for a real challenge. And maybe you went towards the world of ultra running, or maybe you've been thinking about joining the world of triathlons, but they can be really intimidating, right? There's so much to think about and it's just kind of scary. Well, that's what I thought too, but I was actually wrong. And after today, you're probably going to feel a little bit silly for being so apprehensive about it. I know I definitely do. So Rob Wilby is the founder of Team Oxygen Addict and he gives us all the details about transitioning into triathlons and he tells us why as runners we actually have a bit of a psychological advantage in triathlons. So I plan to use his trick and I think you should too. So after a word from our sponsors we'll get right to the interview with Rob. Thank you to Sockany for supporting the Run to the Top podcast. Running might be a low maintenance sport but a good pair of running shoes is a must. Use coupon code TINA for 10% off at Socony.com when you pick out your next pair. I want to say a big thank you to Body Health for sponsoring this podcast and for helping me with my training over the last few years. You can enter to win a pack of six perfect amino bottles for free by visiting runnersconnect.net forward slash body health. Welcome to the Run to the Top podcast, Rob. Thank you very much. It's lovely to be here. It is lovely to have you. and. it, I love that you w- use the word lovely too, because that's such an English word. I don't really ever hear an American say lovely. So ju- you just started it off on the right foot. All the all the female um, American listeners are now now paying attention. And maybe some <laughs> of the men too. Um, <laughs> so we are, Venice Connect has been kind of uh, working with you guys uh, lately. And that is because we saw something in you guys very similar to what we do. You're, we liked the attitude. We liked um, the way that you run business. And we just felt like it would be a great um, way to help our runners who are interested in triathlons, which a lot of people, that is a natural progression to go from when you've done all the running events to kind of move and try to triathlon events. So for those who are wondering, uh, maybe you could give us a little background and tell us what is Team Oxygen Addict? Yeah, sure. Well, I think you've hit the nail on the head really because um, there are there seem to be so many people coming over from running into triathlon and that's exactly how I got into the sport myself. Hmm. I was a, a sort of a high school track runner and then in my sort of late 20s, a friend of mine was doing a triathlon and said, you know, why don't you come and do this? And and he was doing a half Ironman at the time. And I was just like, that is the most insane thing I've ever heard. <laughs> you know, you're going to swim for a mile and a bit and then ride for 90 kilometers and then do a half marathon. And he told me about it and we were sitting in the pub. And the next thing I knew, I woke up the next morning after we'd had a night out and I, I had an email that said, congratulations, you're entered for half Ironman UK. <laughs> and he talked me into entering. So that was kind of my my baptism of fire as a as at that point a, a not 
very much more than social jogger anymore. It was a case of you've got a year to get yourself in shape to do a half Ironman. Um, so I can completely understand where your audience are coming from if they're sitting there and thinking, well, I've, I've done loads of running events and I'm thinking about doing something different. And I think there's a natural progression, isn't there, when people have, have gone through and raced Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes up to marathon or even if they've just got a little bit stale with with whatever distance they're racing to think that they they fancy a new challenge really and um and yeah we've seen loads of athletes coming to triathlon from a running background so we're pretty excited to get on the show and and talk to your audience really about how we can sort of help people get into triathlon for the first time mm -hmm, which is great and and i found it interesting that you said you had a year to get ready because i think um, a lot of runners or people in general are kind of a bit guilty of being like, oh, my half or what my, you know, half Ironman or whatever it is, is in six months. So I'll start training for it, you know, in a, in a, in a few weeks. And then that turns into like, ah, I've got, I've got a race in two months. So I'm impressed you, you thought all the way you know, a year out, you managed to think about it. You, you shouldn't be impressed by it. There was no forethought at all. It just happened to me that was the <laughs> night I was out with my friend. Um, and if I'd known what I was getting myself into, I think I'd probably have second guessed it, to be honest. But <laughs> I mean, yeah, we we I think a function of what's happened in triathlon over the last few years is that so many of these races are now selling out mm. year in advance. You know, a lot of the big half Ironman and Ironman races, or I should say 70.3 these days. You know, Why do they say that? Out. Just for curious. We can. Um, I, th I think they, they sort of rebranded half Ironman several years ago because they didn't want it to be a half anything. So they rebranded it as 70.3 okay. because that's the, that's the distance in miles you end up covering. If you can believe that it's yeah. when you add up the swim bike and run, it becomes 70.3 miles. So sorry, uh, you were saying they were selling out. Yeah. So a, a lot of these big races, especially the big branded ones will, will go on sale the week after that year's event and wow. they'll sell out in, you know, some of the big European races and American races these days will sell out in a matter of hours. Wow. So uh, people have got to be really organized to even, you know, to even get in the event. So uh, that I think then lends itself to people saying, well, I'm, I'm going to enter Ironman Florida for next year or whatever it is. And they have to do it a whole year in advance. And then it kind of focuses your mind yeah. on, I better get some training done and put a plan in place to get you there. So, so that's really where we come in. That's that's kind of our little niche is helping people prepare. And you don't have to have a whole year's run up to it. We, we get lots of athletes who are coming in at, you know, six months to go and things like that. But from our point of view as, as a coaching team, obviously, the more time we've got people for, the more thoroughly we can do the job, really. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And, uh, and th you know, that in itself is good advice for people. Um, if you are considering, you know, making this transition, well, start looking now, even if it is going to be, you know, a little while before you actually do it. You, If you really want to do one that, you know, you, you want to do rather than just one for the sake of it, then you might have to look ahead. Mm. Um, that, I mean, I think that's going to surprise a lot of people listening. Yeah, maybe. I was surprised. Yeah. For the first time, it's, mm -hmm. it really can be a deal of, you know, you're going to have to be ready a year in advance and it's a bit of a race to even enter sometimes. Yeah, no, definitely sounds like it. And uh, thanks for the heads up there. And and the name Oxygen Addict, where did that come from? And that's quite a mouthful to say, might I add, Oxygen Addict. It is, isn't it? It's, it's not the easiest <laughs> It's not the easiest to say and it doesn't trip off the tongue. Um, it, do you know, it was just one of those... About five years ago, I was, um, I'll tell my backstory a little bit in a yeah, minute. Yeah, sure. I was, I, was, I was looking for a name for the company and I was, as you do, sketch pad and a, a pen and a paper. And um, it kind of came to me in a flash of inspiration that a lot of the people who were doing triathlons were, I think addict is the wrong word to, to apply to this, but so passionate about the sport. Mm -hmm. And I want something that that kind of encompassed that. And, and I didn't want to use triathlon addict. And I thought, well... We're all out there running, swimming, biking. It's all to do with breathing and oxygen and exercising. And, and, and it just kind of came in a flash of inspiration. So, uh, yeah, it's a strange one and it isn't easy to say, but we've had some really nice kit made up these days and it kind of fills the chest of the kit really nicely. We've got oh. you know, oxygen addicts on there. So uh, it's uh, it's something that gets a giggle out of the crowds as you're running by for sure. So we've unwittingly managed to get a little brand in there anyway. That's good. That's good. And uh, with the triathlon uh, outfit i mean i'm just curious with uh, maybe the pros i don't know about everyone else but uh in running you know you're they're very limited with branding and kind of you have to keep your logo within a certain size and you have to Got ya. 
do, yeah. do you have the same thing within the triathlon world or is it kind of not at all oh, that's... it's it's the wild west of kid yeah. advertising <laughs> You can pretty much have, from a pro like yourself's point of view, you can pretty much have as many logos as you can fit on there, and it's and it's encouraged. You know, the the triathlon is a uh, certainly at the the Ironman seventy point three and age group level, anything goes kit wise, and mm. you know the more the more advertising you can do, um, that's how a lot of pros basically make their money. They'll sell space on their chest. Yeah. in order to to get an income which i'm sure would go down well in the running community as well wouldn't it really i'm sure it would but um yeah i just i can't even imagine that right now i mean uh my jersey obviously says Sockany on it and yeah. it's quite clear but um that's all i'm really allowed so that's really interesting that it's so different and hopefully running will kind of follow suit along the way <laughs> Well, maybe the other way to look at it, Tina, is we need to get you to do a triathlon and you could have, you could mm. have Sockany and massive letters on your kid. Then. Yeah, there you go. I do actually, you say that, I do actually have a Sockany triathlon outfit that I was uh, given once by my rep. So I do Love already it. have the outfit. So maybe that'll be the so next one. So what we need now is a bit of pressure from your listeners. How about <laughs> we say 10, 10 listeners email and then you have to do, you have to do a triathlon. <laughs> well, you're, I, I'm starting to get, uh, I'm having to commit to all these uh, events events now i had a ginger runner or ethan newbury on uh, i don't know a few months ago and uh he he was making making me sign up or telling me i would i was going to run an ultra so i'm going to start uh being uh one of those runners who goes to do you know an event every weekend at this rate <laughs> we'll, we'll yeah. see but i anyway <laughs> we're here to talk about you today so let's hear your <laughs> yeah, background sorry. yeah i know you're signing me oh. up for things i want to hear about you and your background i'm sure everyone else does too they know enough right, well, about me <laughs> I'll, I'll give you that i'll give you the greatest hits and well i was a i was a school teacher originally i was a school teacher for 18 years and i was a, a phys ed teacher um but I was always into endurance sports. So I was I was kind of a unique niche in teaching that I was never really into rugby and football as a kid. And I wasn't as a teacher. And you know what the British school yeah. system's like. So <laughs> I used to run the high school track team, the cross country team, the swimming team. We even had a, a mountain biking team for a little while, if you can believe that. Wow, that's cool. So yeah, it was. It was really nice. And, and because of that, the kids who weren't into team sports would kind of gravitate to me. And, mm-hmm. and we had a nice little scene going where... I would take them running after school and we'd go swimming after school. And, yeah. and so, you know, that was my, that was my thing. And I think with, with any teacher or coach who's passionate about it, you work with kids who feel passionate as well. And if they want to train, they get good and they end up, you know, we had a few kids who got to international level and won medals on that kind of stage purely because we had the setup where they had a few other kids to train with and a teacher who would show up to coach them, you know? Mm -hmm. So, so that was my background with that. And I I mentioned when I was in my late twenties, I entered a a triathlon for a bit of a laugh and having done the, the first Ironman or the first 70.3 UK as it was at the time. Um, I was just hooked by it. I'd, I'd faded away from running, having, you know, I pretty much ran all the way from being about nine or 10 years old through to about 20 at university and then suffered that kind of late teens burnout thing Mm -hmm. and so getting into triathlon for me was like a breath of fresh air there was all these different sports to be doing all the time um at the time I was a bit burnt out on running so getting to go for bike rides and swims was was really brilliant for me so getting into triathlon at that point and coaching kids at swimming and biking and running I ended up in a local tri club they needed a coach and I, I naturally started helping out there a little bit. And, um, and really that was, that was my introduction into coaching. And I think as is the way in a lot of sports, I got quick at triathlon quite quickly. Um, and people thought I had some kind of magic bullet, you know, cause mm-hmm. they'd seen me come in as a beginner and then be almost on the podium the next season. People thought that there was some kind of secret I had and would be asking for advice when really there was nothing more to it other than I just loved training and I was kind of finding what stuck really. So that was my introduction into coaching in a, in a club setting. And then people would ask me for help with a personal plan. And after a while, somebody offered to pay me to write them a plan, which I thought, well, this is fantastic. You know, <laughs> yeah. it, there just isn't the culture of that in running, or there certainly wasn't over here at that time. So when someone said, well, I'm paying this guy to coach me for triathlon, I'd rather you do it. And I thought, brilliant. And that very quickly led to a kind of a business that grew to a part-time business. And then when my wife and I had our child, I went part-time at school to spend more time with him at home and kind of co-parent with my wife. 
And I could write training plans and coach people and do coach calls in the evenings while my son was asleep. So it became this fantastic, flexible working arrangement. Mm, yeah. Um, so I was super lucky that I was in the right place at the right time and ended up having, you know, almost un unwittingly developed the skill set to help people along the way. And a couple of years ago, it got to the point where I said to my wife, I think I could, I could make a full-time business of this. And she said, go for it. So here we are a couple of years later, I've been running this, this personal one-to-one -one coaching business and was getting more and more requests for people for coaching and sat down with a friend of mine and said, we need to make a business out of this. We've got to find a way that we could coach multiple people that doesn't depend on one-to-one -one interactions and my time as much as this does at the minute. So we sketched out the idea for Team Oxygen Addict being an online based team where all the training plans are pre-written in the background. And so I've got plans for Ironman Distance, 70.3 Olympic Sprint and Duathlon that were essentially based on the plans I'd originally written for my one-to-one -one athletes. But I can then kind of streamline people as they come in based on their background, their training history, the history in the different sports. Um, how much time they've got available to train each week. And once we worked out a system to kind of funnel people into the appropriate plan for them, we've managed to offer what's essentially, I think, 99% of the benefits of one-to-one -one coaching, less than half the price of what I was charging before. And people seem to really have gone for it. We've we've also set up like a an online community in a Facebook group. And what you said in your introduction, I think, holds true. It's very similar to what you've done with Runners Connect. Mm-hmm. We're looking in a lot of online forums and a lot of Facebook groups for triathletes. And there are just so many negative people and so many trolls in these forums. Yeah, absolutely. That just, you know, they just seem to exist to make people's lives hard. And <laughs> when people are new, or even if people aren't new to it, we just didn't want that kind of, <laughs> that kind of attitude around. So we've got this private Facebook group where I offer coaching advice to the athletes in there. They've got the training plan. And if anything needs to change, we talk in the Facebook group and they say, you know, I've got to go away this weekend. What do I do? And everybody else learns from everybody else's questions. So the communication from my point of view takes a whole lot less time than it would do with 70 private athletes. Mm -hmm. But the athletes get all the information that they need in there. Plus, they really support each other as well. Yes, that's actually what I was just about to say is um, the my favorite thing about Runners Connect is just the community and how they interact with one another. And, you know, just if one person has a bad day, everyone jumps on and kind of supports them. And that, I just think that's so great. And it's, it's, it's really cool that you've got that for the same thing with these, um, you know, triathletes. And I'm guessing if it's, um, you know, if a lot of people are kind of transitioning from running or from swimming or biking, they are kind of a little bit scared. It's a bit of an unknown. And, you know, you hear how intense and how hard this is. So um, I could imagine you need all that support. So what is, um, what would you say the percentage of people in your group or, you know, that do transition over to triathlons are runners? And, you know, what would you say to someone who is kind of considering making that jump to show them that they have, they would have support um, from the rest of the community in the same way they do with running? Well, the first thing I'd say to anyone who's considering doing triathlon is, I think you're dead right with what you say. People are intimidated by it and they're intimidated by that they turn up on race day and it seems like everybody's got an expensive bike and flash kit and it seems like everybody's got a skin suit and, you know, it can, it can feel very intimidating, but I guarantee that everybody has felt that way at their first event and the triathlon community because it's entirely made up of people who felt like that at their first event, seem to be so friendly and welcoming. I've never come across anybody who's elitist or snobbish at all in any of the events I've ever been to. And everybody seems to be, people are racing side by side. You know, it's a side by side sport. My, my performance doesn't depend on you losing like it would in soccer. We can both have fantastic races and we can ride side by side and push mm -hmm. each other on. I think that's what's great about it. But in the early days, there is this barrier to entry of being afraid that you won't be good enough. And I think for your community as runners, the barrier tends to be worrying, you know, I either I can't swim very well or I can't bike very well. Um, but I, I hear that equally from people who've come in from a swimming background, being running, uh, worried that they can't run very well and cyclists worrying that they can't run or swim very well. So everybody's got this worry when they come in. So that's the first thing to think is 
everybody's felt like that. Everyone who's a beginner is, is as nervous as you are about their ability. And without a doubt, the people who make the strongest athletes in triathlon come from a running background because firstly, they've got that basis of um, the aerobic background. You know, they used to structured training and because the run is at the end of the triathlon, it is traditionally the hardest part of the race. And if someone's a swimmer or a biker, can absolutely guarantee that they're dreading the run part of it. Mm-hmm. And if you're a runner coming into the sport, if you look at the race in, in general, if you can be fast when the race is slow, the whole of that final section, the whole of the run event, you're in a, a positive mental attitude of I'm passing people and I seem to be doing better than other people here. And, and from a runner, sorry, from a running background myself, it's very different the run in a triathlon to the run in a running event because, you know, in a running event, the gun goes, everybody goes off and the faster runners run away from you and you run away from the slower runners. And maybe a few places will change towards the last mile, but, but by and large, you'll, you'll run with the same group of people during a race, right? Mm-hmm. It's pretty rare that, that places change that much. Whereas in a triathlon, especially if you've come from a running background, you'll be running past people the whole time and feeling like a total rock star. Yeah. So it's a really good way to come into it. If you come in from a swimming background, I've got a really good friend who came from a swimming background and we're about even overall in triathlon. But his experience of the race is he gets out of the water in first or second place and then he gets passed for the whole bike ride by people and his mental his mental um, attitude then is, I've just been passed by people. I'm having a really bad day. And he's still way ahead of me at the end of the bike leg. And then during the run, he gets passed by people. And I might just catch him with a mile to go. But the difference in my experience to his experience is I've been passing people the whole way through the oh, race yeah. because I'm not a very good swimmer and feeling good about myself. The swimmers tend to be, you know, have that kind of other people are passing me experience. So there's a lot positive there if you're from a running background and you enter a triathlon. Yeah, I didn't even think about the the mental side of things of, yeah, even if you do really struggle with the other two, that you're, when it comes to the run, you're still going to be stronger for the most part than most of the other people around you. So you will be passing people, which will build your confidence. And, and that's the part you need it most because that's the part, you know, by then, we're kind of tired, so it's very easy for the mental Absolutely. demons to come through. So I didn't even think about that, but that's a great point. And I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up because I think that's something important for people considering uh, a triathlon is you do have a lot of advantages. And I was going to ask you about that, um, you know, that if is there a benefit of being a runner um, when you when it mm. comes to that over the other sports? And, and that's probably it. But what... Um, what would you say? I've heard in the past from people um, that, uh, you know, it's one thing to be a good runner, but it's a whole new ball game trying to run after cycling. Uh, what would you like to say about that? Is that true? I think it's it's undeniable that you're going to feel quite special <laughs> for the first five minutes running off the bike. And, and you never you'll never feel normal as you start to run, running off the bike for the first five minutes. You're always going to have kind of heavy legs and heavy quads. And and the only thing I can liken it to from running is it's like running the day after you've had a heavy strength workout in the gym. Okay. If you've, you know, in your winter phase when you're doing a lot of squats in the gym and the next day you go for a run and your quads just feel kind of like two strange lumps of meat on the front of your legs. <laughs> but but then they come round, you know, in a triathlon, your experience is usually after the first five minutes or so, your legs do come round. And then I think runners from a running background then have a much easier time of it because they will very probably have spent time doing running drills and running form and they understand that. And so they can concentrate on the running form as as they're running their running leg of the triathlon. I think people from a swim and a bike background just kind of, they're in that just put one foot in front of the mm-hmm. other mindset. And so I do think people from a running background have got a big a big advantage at that point. Yeah, for sure. But you know, there's, there's no question you will feel like you've got an elephant sitting on your shoulders for the first (laughs) five minutes. (laughs) And it probably is somewhat like when you, you know, after you run up a hill, uh, when you get to the top, your legs feel a bit weird, but then they, they come back to you essentially a few minutes later. 
Exactly um, that. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. The feeling of running up a hard hill and across country and then a minute later they'll come back and, mm-hmm. and you kind of recover from that. And that's a real important thing. I think runners understand that you can feel terrible for a few minutes in a race and then recover. If you're not from a running background and you start to feel terrible in a race, you naturally assume you're going to feel terrible yeah, very rest true. of the leg. Very true. And um, no, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that as well, because I think it's something important that, uh, you know, we do need to keep in mind. Again, that's that advantage that runners have. Um, and then I just wanted you to talk maybe for a minute about um, just the levels um, thing here. I mean, we we touched on it earlier about, um, you know, people shouldn't be worried that everyone is feeling the same. But do you see um, triathletes of all levels competing here or, you know, I just want to kind of clarify this for people who are thinking, you know, that's all well and good that you are competing with your friend who is winning the swim, but I'm never going to win or never going to make it first out of anything. Or, you know, I'm, I'm yeah. a mid pack runner. So why will I even be able to stay, uh, you know, out of the last place in the tri- in a triathlon? So what would you like to say to different levels of runners? Well, the, the thing I do is I'll, I'll draw this analogy from my friend Simon again. He he swam as a kid, but didn't swim as an adult. So he had good stroke mechanics as a kid, but he hadn't trained for years and years. And then he started doing a bit of jogging and he was he'd put a bit of weight on. So he was he was heavier than he had been. And his experience of taking up triathlon was that the cycling helped him lose weight. The losing weight helped his running. He discovered that he could swim quite well compared to other people and then when he got in a triathlon he'd never been sort of a good swimmer in a swim club but in a triathlon he was he was a good swimmer he was getting out in the first handful of people and as a runner he was a kind of I guess he was probably a four-hour marathon runner as a guy so you know front of mid pack in a marathon Mm -hmm. but he'd never considered himself to be a good marathon runner and then having lost this weight he found his marathon time came down closer to 330 but what he discovered was his big strength was he had this big diesel engine that could just keep on going, which he'd never had chance to sort of realize the benefit of in either swimming or running. So when he went and tried an Ironman, he found he could just keep going all day. Hmm. And whereas a 3.30 marathon, you know, it's not particularly fast in inverted commas in marathon running terms. In terms of an Ironman marathon, that was one of the faster runs in his age group on the day. So he went from thinking of himself as a, you know, just a normal runner in inverted commas who enjoyed club running to being a very, very good Ironman triathlete because his big strength was he could just keep going when everybody else slowed down. Hmm, interesting. And, yeah. Cycling for a hundred odd miles didn't seem to affect his, his marathon running pace at all. So all of a sudden he was at this point where he was, you know, he was a very, very good triathlete when you looked at the three sports across all three disciplines. And he would never have known that. And the effect it had on him was he, it changed his whole perception of himself. He became, you know, a, a triathlete in his head mm-hmm. rather than just someone who'd exercised for fun before. So I think sometimes people will learn things about themselves by trying something new that might reveal a whole other side to the character that, that they never knew was even there. Yeah. That's great. That's a, that's a good point and uh, definitely a good example. I know a lot of you listening are, um, you know, running a BQ is your, is your main goal. So, you know, this is the kind of level we're talking about here. And, and what would you say to people who are, you know, maybe four to five hour marathoners? Is there, is there somewhere for them to go in the triathlon world or is, is it? Um, Honestly, I would, I would encourage anybody, if you get the chance and you live near enough to go down and watch one of the big races and you go down and see how inclusive triathlon is as a sport, you'll see the real rock stars at the front end of the field, but you'll also see people who, you know, people who are, are just going to try and make the cutoff, who I think are the real heroes of the sport because they, they are up against the cutoff in the swim and the bike and the run and if you imagine a person who's, you know, swimming maybe two, two and a half hours for the Ironman swim and then the cycling for eight or nine hours and they're just making the cutoff there mm-hmm. and then they're doing a, f- a six or seven hour marathon where a lot of that is going to be power walking and jogging and power walking to try and get to the finish. You've got 17 hours to make the cutoff of mm-hmm. an Ironman triathlon. So there are people of all shapes and sizes there and you've got people into their eighties who are doing these events. So it's, it seems to be a much more inclusive sport than, um, 
and I don't think, no, perhaps not more inclusive than running, but certainly you'll see a massive variety of people at these events and, and it'll surprise people, I think, in terms of the different kinds of people that, that enter these events for sure. Yeah, that's that's good. And I'm glad you mentioned it. I actually, that's one of my things I want to go do is watch um, Ironman Louisville, um, which is uh, about an hour away from me. I keep, I want oh, to do it. I've missed it yeah. twice, but I need to go, um, go see it. Um, okay. And then what about people who say, okay, well, I, I don't mind biking, but I hate swimming or I don't mind swimming, but I hate biking. Do you have to like all three or is it okay if you're, you know, not particularly strong in one or if you don't particularly enjoy one of them? <laughs> well, the, the first thing is like, you're not in the army. No one's going to force you to do it. <laughs> so if you hate swimming or you hate biking, your triathlon might not be for you. <laughs> but what I would say for sure is that the cross training benefits from doing, if you add in some cycling in with your running is often very eye opening. So a lot of the guys I've coached who are from a running background are really worried that their running is going to get worse because they're not running every day. You know, they, they're used to running six times a week and having a rest day or running six days a week and having a recovery day and a massage. And when I start coaching them and saying, right, you're going to run three times a week and you're going to ride three times a week, they're really worried that the running is going to fall apart and suffer. And especially the way I coach people within Team Oxygen Addict is I'll try and get them to do the majority of their hard interval work on the bike because what we found is it's so much safer in terms of not picking up injuries and niggles. Mm. You can, you know, your body doesn't know in terms of, there's no impact on a bike, obviously. Yeah. Your feet are not hitting the ground harder. Whereas, you know yourself, if you're doing a hard workout on the running, the faster you run, the more impact you're producing and the more danger of injury there is. Absolutely. So all of a sudden, what I'm doing here is I'm removing injury risk from these runners. And so, whereas, you know, let's say a uh, your average runner might pick up two or three niggles a year that mean they've got to rest for a week or they've got to do a bit of jogging and they miss their quality sessions. Well, they're consistently running three times a week all the way through the winter. They're doing lots of really hard cardiovascular work on the bike. So the heart and lungs are getting that real high end workout mm -hmm. still. Their body is still getting, my theory is their body's still getting the biomechanical workouts of running easy or steady three times a week. So the ligaments and tendons in their knees and their ankles and their hips are still still strong. They're still durable. They're not losing any fitness in terms of the biomechanical ability to run. When they go into a running race, what they find is in a lot of cases, their top end aerobic fitness is higher than it was before because yeah. they've had a different stimulus on the bike and they're running PBs and they come back to me and they go, how have I just run a 10 K PB when I haven't done any quality work on the running for 10 or 12 weeks? It just doesn't make any sense. And then you say, well, actually it does because you've consistently run for 12 weeks without getting injured. You've done all this hard work on the bike without getting injured. Your body's had a different stimulus without getting injured. And all of a sudden the result of that is it turns out you've got out of your own way and, and you've sort of developed a different way of training that's going to allow you to get even faster on the run yeah I love that and I think that will definitely kind of hit home for a lot of people listening because I know many of you do kind of struggle with you know things coming up you know quite often and uh you know it, without having an expert who can you know analyze every little tiny thing that could have caused it um you know it can be quite frustrating so I think that would yeah, be good yeah. for people to hear so I'm glad you mentioned that and and then, so just uh, when you mentioned about, you know, training for the three sports, do people who, you know, run triathlons typically have three separate coaches or what does the triathlon, triathlon coaching kind of involve usually? Is it one person or more? It, it can involve several coaches. And I think the very top end, you, your professional athletes will, will go to very specific coaches because, you know, that, that tiny, minute percentage difference can make all the difference to them. But in general, for age group triathlon, a triathlon coach will be qualified and informed and um, will coach you in all three of the sports. Okay. So having done triathlon coaching qualifications now, Obviously, myself, I've come from a, a background where I trained as a running coach and a swimming coach and a cycling coach separately, but then trained as a triathlon coach as well. And that gave me the kind of the overall overview of, well, OK, this is how we, we tie all these three together so we don't kill our athlete. <laughs> <laughs> 
Because I think the danger would be with three coaches, your swim coach would give you two or three hard workouts yeah, and so true. would your bike coach and so would you run, you know. So as a triathlon coach, I'll step back and go, right, we're trying to develop you as an entire athlete here. So this is where the hard work for your cardiovascular system is going to happen. This is where the skills work for your swimming is going to happen. This is where the the durability work for your running is going to happen and that's all going to tie together so you get a certain level of aerobic fitness you get a certain level of skill develop and you get a certain level of you know top end fitness relative to whatever your weaknesses are as well so yeah i would i would coach people in all three sports and i think the majority of triathlon coaches these days would do that Mm -hmm. and i i think i think that's good and i'm glad you mentioned that because that was something i was wondering about was how do you if if people do have different coaches, how do they kind of not end up, you know, wrestling for time? And maybe they do. And, you know, obviously that's with the top level athletes, they probably have a sit down with all three of the coaches. But um, exactly. I think it's good yeah. that you kind of, uh, you know, realize what the focus is for each individual athlete and what they need to work on. Um, and then what are what are your thoughts on, you know, one of the things I know people will be probably fearful of is, you know, we hear that um, Ironman uh, events or, you know, I don't know, maybe some not so much with the 70.3, but in particular, Ironman kind of takes over your life. So yeah. what, what if people <laughs> are listening, thinking, well, I just don't have time to spend, you know, six hours a day training. So, yeah, you know, sure. how do I how do I possibly do this? Well, that's a brilliant question. And I think you can you can let the sport take up as much of your life or as little as your life as you like. And I think Ironman in particular and triathlon in general does attract a certain personality type that becomes very involved in what they do. And people are incredibly passionate about the sport and do spend a lot of time on forums talking about bikes and wheels and wetsuits and things. But you don't have to be like that. And I think... The niche that we've tried to go for with Team Oxygen Addict is to say, look, we recognize that there are only a certain number of hours in the week that you've got to train. And certainly when I get into the sport, I was reading these books and being told, well, you're expected to train 16, 18, 20 hours a week. And my attitude was, OK, if that's what it takes. That's what it takes. And then you discover that there really isn't any time for an, an actual life in any of that. <laughs> and you're very tired all the time. And I was constantly on the verge of getting sick or injured or having a cold. And so I kind of, I naturally backed things off and got to the point where I realized, you know, I'm only doing probably half the training I was before and I'm still getting 99% of the benefits of it. So almost I wondered how little training I could do and still be fit for racing. And so that was how the the principle of, my my personal training philosophy came around was thinking, right, I'm going to have to do some hard work on the bike because that's where my weakness is. And I bet I can just do three runs a week and that'll keep my running ticking over. And I'll do a couple of swims a week because that's all the time that I've got. And that next season was the best season I ever had. And I, I'm pretty sure it was because I wasn't completely shelled all the time. Mm -hmm. I wasn't really overtired. And that made me think, well, there are a lot of other people out here like me who are coming from a running background and they'll probably run every day and they might run between, let's say, 30 to 60 minutes a day on average. And so let's say they come into the sport saying, okay, I've got seven hours a week to train. What's the best way to spend that training time in order to get you as fit as we can to have the best overall race performance? And so we basically just try and balance a week and say, we're going to have two or three bike sessions, two or three run sessions, and one or two or three swim sessions that are balanced out to address the weaknesses of your average triathlete. Now, we can't work miracles and I'm not going to lie to people and say, you are definitely going to get better as a swimmer mm -hmm. if you can go to the pool five days a week and practice swimming five days a week mm -hmm. because it's a skill-based swim. But what I'll say to people is what we found, if you put a wetsuit on and the majority of these Ironman or half Ironman races or even Olympic races are wetsuit legal, when you try and swim in a wetsuit, it's almost like paddling a surfboard. Your body will float. It's a, I don't know if you've ever worn a wetsuit to swim in, Tina. Um, no, I've, I've gone surfing in a wetsuit. I don't know if I did much right. swimming. <laughs> but, well, you know how you kind of float naturally in yes. a wetsuit? You yeah. don't have to work to keep yourself away. So you can imagine as you start to swim, it's much, much easier. And the majority of new swimmers spend most of their energy trying to keep their body afloat rather mm. than producing forward propulsion. Mm -hmm. So the first time they put a wetsuit on, they realize, oh, okay, I don't have to worry here about 
you know, fighting for breath and lifting Drowning, my head. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. My body's naturally floating. It's virtually impossible to swim more than a foot under the surface of the water with a wetsuit on, even if you're trying hard. So as soon as athletes realize this, they go, well, all I have to do is get round my Ironman swim, feeling relaxed and within the cutoff. And I've got the whole rest of the triathlon to enjoy. And if they're coming from a running background and they've already got a good level of aerobic fitness, they're probably going to find they're in that kind of mid-pack swim already without needing to spend loads and loads of time in a swimming pool every week. So we've got a whole bunch of athletes who only swim once a week and they focus on improving their technique as they do that and then a little bit of fitness work as well. But if we can get them to that kind of springtime when they can go outside and have an open water swim with their wetsuit on, people sort of say, well, I know what my goals are. I want to complete the swim section of this and feel comfortable and then get on with the biking and the running. Mm -hmm. I'm not bothered about being in the front part of the swim. I just want to feel confident and enjoy the swim. And when they make that mental shift into, I want this to be enjoyable, it gives them a whole other focus. They don't have to spend hours and hours and hours in the pool chasing the, the elusive PB. They just want to be confident swimmers. And that's a big shift for people to make, I think. Yeah, no, and I, I want to talk about swimming a little bit more um, because I think that's the one that's maybe a bit, the one that is feared yeah, the most. Totally. And I think yeah. that's... Um, it can be that's, daunting, can't it? What was that? It can be totally daunting, yeah, can't it? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I want to talk about your swim analysis in a second, but just one question before we move on. I know a lot of our listeners and just runners in general are very passionate about doing everything they can you know um and i just wanted to hear your thoughts on you know let's say someone listening right now is um saying okay i'm gonna try one of these 70.3 but um you know i know you're saying that i don't have to do all the training and i, and I get that but i want to so i'm gonna I'm going to get up at 3 a.m. if it means I get my, you know, run and swim in. And uh, I'm going to, you know, do my biking at 11 p.m. So I get it in. What would you do? You have to worry about people burning out um, at the, you know, re recreational mid pack level or or do you find most people tend to kind of realize pretty quick that you can't it's not really sustainable to kind of go on like that? I think I think a l people from that particular mindset definitely come in and go, I'm going to do everything that I can because this is what it takes. And then they realize that they're completely exhausted. Mm -hmm. Their wife or the husband is not having a fun time in their relationship because they're getting up at 3.30 in the morning and, you know, they're out late every evening. And so I, I think there is a place for this in the sport for people who want to be as good as they possibly can be and are willing to dedicate the time to it. But I think to go back to your question about someone who's first getting into triathlon, I think you'd have to accept you need to build your ability to train before you can train. Okay. And if you try and jump in and do loads of training and swimming and biking straight away, you're probably going to pick up an injury through either swimming or biking in the same way that if you ramped up your mileage too quickly in running, you'd pick up an injury there. Mm -hmm. So my job as a coach is to say to people, look, You've, you might have all this time to train, but you haven't got the ability to do that yet. So let's build your ability to train as quickly as we can, but no quicker than that. And if you're going to want to try and jump in and bike for 10 hours a week straight away, you are going to end up with some kind of knee niggle or ankle niggle or Achilles niggle because your body needs time to adapt to it. So okay. let's train to train before we actually, you know, jump in there. So okay. I'd, I'd say there's a good year's worth of of learning to train to train before you actually get into that phase of throwing loads of hours at the problem. Yeah, that's very interesting and something I wouldn't have thought about. I mean, I know we as runners work on our running form, but it, you know, is just as applicable in biking and swimming. So I'm glad you mentioned yeah, that. And, totally. and yeah, so speaking of swimming, so you have a swim analysis, which is kind of similar to our, again, to our running form course that we, we offer. Um, and I will put links in the show notes to the swim analysis and I guess the form analysis as well. But maybe you could tell Brilliant. us about what that is, uh, what your swim analysis is, because most of us, you know, had swimming lessons as kids. But um, do actually most of us know how to swim correctly or is it um, we have a lot? Of, most people have a lot to fix. Uh, I guess the answer is that it varies. But in general, most people most people can be vastly improved very quickly by having some analysis. And so what we do is we um, we film people both above the water and underneath the water um, 
and then have a look at what's actually happening underneath the water. And over, you know, over the course of five years and hundreds of video swim analysis, you see patterns developing very quickly in the same way that you do when you're analyzing run form. And you realize that what seems to be causing a problem. Do you know, I listened to your your interview that you did with the gait analysis guys. Yep. Um, and one of the things that they said stuck with me, which was along the lines of, I forget exactly what you said, but you, you video somebody, you see what's happening. And the traditional way is, that's a problem. Let's try and fix it. You know, mm-hmm. your leg's sticking out. So let's try and fix your leg sticking out when actually your heel might be kicking out to the side, actually, because your hand is doing something strange. Yeah. And, you know, it's the the foot is the obvious sign that something's wrong, but you can't fix the foot. It's the hand. And it's exactly the same in swimming. A, a real common fault with beginner swimmers is as they go to breathe, their legs will kind of splay apart. And it's very easy for someone to to say to them, well, you, your kicking is awful and it's creating all this drag. You need to practice kicking in order to make that better. But what we found is that that leg splaying apart is always caused by something happening at the front end of the stroke with their arms. Hmm. And so once you fix what they're doing with their arms, and it's very simple to fix that, the legs no longer splay apart and an athlete will go to be, I don't know, five seconds per hundred meters faster wow. in the click of the fingers. And it's not because they've got fitter immediately. It's because you fixed something that was holding them back. You know, it's like they had a parachute holding them back in the water. <laughs> and so the swim analysis is really valuable because somebody, and, and especially this is true for people from a running background, they're already aerobically very fit. And the reason they can't swim quickly is because of a skill-based problem, not because of a fitness-based problem. So we fix the skill problem and they they progress very, very quickly into being mid-pack, front of mid-pack, or sometimes even front-pack swimmers because they're already very fit. Okay. Um, so yeah, so we spent years doing the video analysis on poolside and we, we had a, an expensive waterproof video camera that we used and we'd then get people on poolside and show them. And again, over time, what we've gone to is now with the advent of technology, virtually everyone you know has got a waterproof camera phone or a GoPro or a friend who's got one. And so we tell people, this is how we want you to set yourself up. Use this to hold the GoPro with, use this to fix the GoPro to the the stick, essentially. And then we give people instructions on, we want you to swim a length with your friend filming you in this position, swim a length with them filming you in this position, and then email us the video. And then we can do that analysis remotely we can send people back. Okay. Um, our swim analysis coaches will, will basically send the video back with voiceover over it, describing what's happening Mm. with annotations on the screen, showing them what's happening and saying, this is the problem. And these are the drills you now need to do for the next six weeks to fix that. Send us another video in six weeks and you'll be amazed at the difference. And Again, the world gets smaller, doesn't it, with technology? Something that had to happen in person can now happen remotely, like you and me talking across the Atlantic, for example. Yeah, Yeah, no, and and it's and it's been, you know, this is one of the examples of technology really, you know, helping us and making making people all over the world be able to improve and and I think that's great. And and just uh I wanted to mention, you know, you mentioned about people having a waterproof phone or a waterproof um or a GoPro, but you can also get um just on Amazon, I'll put a link in the show notes or you know, somewhere online, you can get uh waterproof cases to put your phone in or put your camera in and I actually have one of those for my phone and it works well. So I'll put a link in the show notes for that, which I don't think I've mentioned yet. So that's at runnersconnect.net forward slash RC142. Um, so then just if someone, you know, does have um, what they think is is bad form, um, is there like one best form or is it kind of a bit like running where um, there's some tweaks you need to make, but everyone kind of ha- uh, becomes their most efficient um you know, uh, swimmer and there's a, there's a variety of forms to use. Well, I'll give you a couple of tips that everyone can apply to the swimming. If people are thinking about taking up triathlon, a couple of key things, the the first thing, and this sounds really, really easy and stupidly simple, but Mm -hmm. a lot of people don't breathe out with the face in the water. And that's the first key to swimming relaxed. We need people blowing their air out into the water. So as they turn their head to breathe, the whole time their mouth is out of the water, they can suck oxygen in. Now, that sounds like the most patronizing piece of advice ever, but 
I coached a guy who who went on last year to become a world champion and no one had ever told him he should be breathing out into the water. <laughs> he was he was already a front pack swimmer, but in watching him swim, I said, you know, I, I kind of feel, <laughs> I was a bit like, who am I to tell you this kind of thing? But I said, are you breathing out under the water? And we filmed him and he wasn't. <laughs> and that immediately took another five minutes off his Ironman swim. Uh-huh. So he was already one of the best swimmers in the world in his age group and it made him even better. And he said afterwards, can't believe I, no one's ever told me that. So it sounds like obvious advice, but it's only obvious if people tell you, I guess. So blow that air out into the water and breathe in with your, obviously with your face out of the water. <laughs> and so do you breathe, do you breathe one side or both? I always encourage my athletes to try and learn to breathe on both sides okay. because what that does is it evens your stroke up. And most of us learn to swim as children and only breathe on one side because that's what's comfortable. If you can learn to breathe on both sides, it evens your stroke out, which again, usually takes away a problem at the back end of the stroke and means you'll be quicker. But also when you're in a race, you've obviously got an advantage if you can you can look either side of you. If the sun's maybe rising on one side, it's mm. useful to be able to breathe on the other. If the wind is blowing waves and chop towards you, it's useful to be able to breathe on the other side and you just feel more comfortable in the water. So it usually takes only about five or maybe six sessions to go from feeling like I just can't breathe on that side to I'm completely natural and comfortable breathing mm-hmm. on both sides. You just have to persevere for that kind of six session block. Yeah. So, and I will so agree with thing. that as well. I've, I definitely, uh, this year I tried to start breathing both sides and it did, it did feel weird for a while, but it did can come pretty naturally after a few sessions. So anyway, you see, this is going. all creeping out. You've got the triathlon suit. You've been doing a bit of swim practice. Well, and I can tell you we're, one we're more thing. Get you there, Tina. I started as a swimmer. That's how I ended up running. <laughs> is that right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I'm thinking you swam as a kid. You've run a two thirty six marathon. There's got to be a potential triathlete in here somewhere. Yeah, Tina. <laughs> there is. There is. It's on the list. It's on the list. Trust me. So. Um, but I want to make this about other people because we're helping them. <laughs> yeah, and I know um, you're going to get me by the end, but um, yeah, I'm trying I'm to put, I'm trying it. to keep myself from officially signing up here. So any more <laughs> form things for swimming <laughs> that you'd like to mention? I, I think that the main thing is just to make sure that the swim training that you're doing is skill based rather than fitness based. Yeah. And the one main thing we see with runners coming into swimming is they approach a swim set with the same mentality, they approach an interval set on the track, which is get if through. I try harder, I'll get faster. And it, unfortunately, it just isn't the case in swimming because the harder you try, almost you'll go no faster. The key to swimming better is to improve your technique. And so the line I always use is you want to practice good technique and get fit as a byproduct of simply practicing good technique rather than trying to get fit and thinking that your technique will improve. So um, getting, I'm not saying people have to come to us for video swim analysis at all, quite the opposite. If you find a, a local swim masters group with a good swim coach, just get them to look over your stroke and, and give you one technique tip because usually that's all our little brains can absorb. And that's what we do. We say, here's one thing you need to change come back and see us in six weeks that one technique needs to get worked on get embedded and then work on the next thing so it's like a hierarchy of problems really this is Mm -hmm. your biggest problem get that fixed practice swimming with that new corrected problem and then work on the next problem because if you try and concentrate on on more than one thing as well as breathing with your face out of the water then things will tend to go to pot yeah. And and would you say then, so for anyone listening who has typically said, oh, I'm not a good swimmer, um, but they are a runner and they have that aerobic base. The reason they would probably say that is because something they have pretty, you know, something in their uh, swimming form that is kind of holding them back rather than Absolutely. just not being fit as a swimmer. Absolutely. Okay. That, that's a hundred percent of it. It's, it's an entirely skill-based sport. And if you go down to a master swim session, you'll see there's guaranteed to be people who are very overweight. There's guaranteed to be people who are in their sixties and seventies who are much better swimmers than you are. And you look at them and you think, well, that just shouldn't be the case. That lady who looks like my grandma <laughs> shouldn't be able to, to, to outswim that guy over there 
who looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger just doesn't make any sense. But they can. They can apply force to the water in a skillful way. And if we haven't learned how to do that yet, then you're not going to be able to move through the water quickly. So it's beautiful. That's the thing I really love about swimming is you'll see people in their 70s still out swimming, Mm -hmm. people in their teens and 20s. You'll see people who've swum as kids and then they've put weight on because of lifestyle issues later in life but they can still swim incredibly well yeah i've seen people like that Mm -hmm. you know there's no impact there's no weight bearing thing they get a great aerobic workout but there's no injury danger there at all so it's a fantastically inclusive sport like that oh that's great and I'm, i'm glad you you mentioned that and one more thing about swimming before we um move on is um what about open water swimming i know i know a few people are maybe a bit fearful of that it's completely different to swimming in a in a nice comfortable pool um so maybe you could just tell us a little bit about how that changes things and again i think it's all to do with your mindset it can be intimidating the first time you go down so the key is to make it easy on yourself and if you can go down to an organized session ideally with someone who's coaching it ideally with other beginners as well who'll support you that's a great way to get into it if you can go down to a place where the water's not freezing cold all the better. Mm -hmm. If you can go down to a place where the water has got good visibility, all the better. And just make life as easy for yourself as you can. Because I mean, in England, where I live, (laughs) the open water swim venue is is a reclaimed quarry that the diving club use. It barely gets above 10 degrees C in the middle of summer. It's murky. It's not the ideal place for a beginner to go down the first time. Whereas if you go down to one of the other local swim lakes, that's maybe only four feet deep at the deepest part, you can stand up all the way around. It's lovely and warm. It's clear. There's loads of beginners. It'll just reassure you that there are other people there feeling like you. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is, if you can borrow a wetsuit, rent a wetsuit, even if you want to get into it and you buy a cheap wetsuit, they're very inexpensive these days for, a you know, you can pick up an ex-rental wetsuit for probably 40 or $50. You'll get in the water and you'll be absolutely amazed about the fact that your body, not only does it not sink, but you can't swim it underwater. Mm-hmm. You'll just be a floaty seal. And when you realize that, that you just, you can sit in a sitting position in the water and not go anywhere, that'll take away all of your anxiety. So that's the first part of it, I think. Okay, that's good to know. And uh, so you don't go swimming down the River Thames? <laughs> <laughs> Not personally. Although I do have a, I have an athlete I coach who oh, no. swam the entire length of oh, the Manchester no. Ship Canal. Oh, okay. All that. right. That's not yeah. as bad. The Thames makes me feel sick thinking about swimming in there. <laughs> but okay. <laughs> all right. I thought you were going to say someone swam down the Thames. I was going to ask you if they grew an extra arm or something. With <laughs> the, I tell you what, the Manchester Ship Canal doesn't look a lot different to uh-huh. it. Okay. <laughs> well, good to know. All right. And then just uh, before we kind of move on to the final section um with someone if they were going to maybe purchase a wetsuit or purchase a bike if they are going to be you know going to give this a real go uh, are there any brands that you would recommend in particular for those um to kind of be a trusting brand and obviously there's going to be different levels depending on what you want but uh, what brands should people look for um the first thing i'd say is that all wetsuit manufacturers these days, the, okay. the manufacturers have come so far in the last 10 years that they do not feel like a surfing wetsuit does. They are thin shoulders, they're stretchy, they almost don't feel like you've got anything gone. Um, my company worked with a British company called Hoob, who are fantastic. They're a British company and we absolutely love them. But there are other brands out there as well. <laughs> okay. And what about biking? Um, in terms of biking, again, there are there are lots of really good brands out there. And I think the most important thing about a bike is, is go to a shop where you're going to get some good advice and get one that fits you properly. That's much more important than any kind of branding. Um, get some advice about a bike fit and talk to the people. And if you can go to a shop that understands you want to do triathlon rather than road cycling, that's going to be all the better because they're going to understand there's some slight differences about the way a bike fits for triathlon where you've got to run off the bike compared to just cycling. So go to a place that understands that. And um, yeah, any reputable brand these days will be producing really good bikes at a decent price point. Okay, good to know and very helpful because then people, you know, don't have to go to a specific area. They can just, you know, look for what's around you. So you have um, a podcast yourself. So maybe tell us a bit about your podcast and what it is. 
Yeah, so we we run this uh, this triathlon podcast that's been going for a couple of years. Um, it was the, the Cup of Tri podcast for two years, and we've just rebranded as the Oxygen Addict Triathlon podcast, actually. So we're just shifting names as we speak to, to kind of you know draw everything under the same brand. And it, it started with me and a, a lady that I coach called Helen, who we just wanted to have some fun and interview some up-and-coming British athletes. And it, it grew from the point of interviewing initially local athletes to where we lived to the point where we've had you know multiple world champions on the show we've we've had chrissy wellington on we've had uh, basically every enormous big name professional triathlete you can think of and it's just such a great way to give back to the triathlon community because people can tweet us and ask questions and we'll say you know we're interviewing such and such next week what would you like to ask him mm-hmm. or her and it genuinely feels like we've we've managed to bring the triathlon community closer together. And they're a really lovely bunch of people, the listeners. It's They'll tweet us and we'll tweet them back. And um, yeah, it's been really, really good fun. Oh, that's good. And and yeah, I've definitely encouraged some people to uh, go check it out and take a listen, especially if we've kind of piqued your interest today. Although just to be, uh, have you interviewed either Non Stanford or Indy Lee? No, which, you know, as, as we're speaking today, we've got an interview lined up with Non. So by the time okay. this goes live, she might actually have been oh, on. Uh, yeah, I used to race against Non. Well, Indy is, uh, really? is a good friend of mine, but um, yeah, I used to race against Non when I was a kid. So that's kind of funny. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, I just thought I'd ask that on the on the random, a bit of a selfish question. So sorry, everyone. Um, all right, we are just going to take <laughs> a. <laughs> we're just going to take a moment to thank our sponsors, and then we'll be right back with the final kick round. By now, you've probably heard me talk about how a Body Health Perfect Amino is the perfect blend of the eight essential amino acids to help you build and repair your muscles, your tissues, and of course, improve recovery. I take it along with their complete plus detox multivitamin. And during my recent marathon build-up, I took Perfect Amino a few times a day, which allowed me to bounce back from my workouts quicker and to keep training hard so I could have a good race in the fall, which is kind of important, right? Have you used coupon code TINA10 yet? The Body Health team would love to hear your feedback. Yes, another reason I love them. And you can share your experience with Perfect Amino through the show notes for this episode by visiting runnersconnect.net forward slash body health. Oh, and you can enter to win a six pack worth $230 there too. So once again, that link is runnersconnect.net forward slash body health. I wish you all the luck. This is the time of year many of us commit to being better and doing what we can to reach our goals. For me, it's doing more stretching and mobility work, and you've heard me admit it here, so hold me to it. But once the busyness of life, the nasty weather, and the tiredness from training accumulates in our legs, that motivation slips away, and it can be really hard to get it back. Now, we could reward ourselves with food, but after all that indulging over the holidays, most of us probably need to work on making better choices. We all know that new running shoes or new running clothes have a bit of a power to get us excited about running again, especially if they look stylish. The Saucony Freedom ISO has become my new favourite shoe, not just because they're nice to look at, but because the Ever Run soul gives back with every step. So even on my most tired day, I feel like I'm getting a little bit of a push from the ground. I absolutely love them and I think you will too. So if you live in the US, make sure you use coupon code TINA to get 10% off your order at Saucony.com. All right, Rob, just five more questions for you, maybe slightly modified to usual to um, make it maximize your potential as a um, expert um, triathlete. So what would be the greatest advice you've ever received? Um, do you know what? I picked a motivational quote for this, if that's OK. Sure, yep. This is, this is a, a JFK quote because I know you've got a massive audience in America. So <laughs> JFK said, Use time as a tool and not as a couch. Ooh. And that's written and stuck on my wall. I, I think like that's that. the best bit of advice for anybody. Use time as a tool and not as a couch and get stuff done rather than thinking I'll do it tomorrow. Mm, <laughs> I like that. I like that. That's definitely something that will keep it in the forefront of your mind of doing something about yeah, your life sure. today. Good. Love that. Um, favorite running or triathlon book or blog? So my favorite running book 
is a book by a British marathon runner from the 1980s called Charlie Spedding, who I'm sure you'll have heard of. Yep. He, he won the London Marathon and he had a bronze medal at the 84 Olympics in LA. And he wrote a book called uh, From Last to First, which is absolutely brilliant. Okay. If, if you've not read it, you, you should check it out because the first chapter in that book is literally unput downable. I've given it to people who have got no interest in running and it's the most powerful chapter about he describes sitting down just before the the 84 olympics and what's going through his mind and describes the race it's just brilliant and okay he's one of my all-time heroes <laughs> cool yeah no I, do, I i haven't actually heard of that one so i will put i will put that one down myself and take a read so thank you um what would you like to tell a new triathlete if you could give them one piece of advice this is going to be a funny one for your audience, but my, my advice is that when you run training, I want you to take a walk break every 10 minutes. So all of my runners, all of my triathletes, when they're doing their long runs, I make them walk for a minute every 10 minutes. And people really struggle with it and they say, I really don't want to do that. Why are you making me walk? There's no way it's going to make me faster. But it helps the recovery from the long run so much hmm. that they can train again the next day. And so... um it really is like the hidden secret to the way I train triathletes to run strong off the bike. And it's especially at 70.3 and Ironman, because I'm sure you can imagine if your legs are completely trashed from doing a long run, it's very hard to then go and do some bike or swim training the next day. But oh, with yeah. this walk break, they bounce back from it almost immediately. Okay, great. Very interesting. But thank you. That, that definitely is uh, worth mentioning for sure. All right. What is your pre-race meal? Do you know, it's muesli, muesli and skimmed milk. So for the American listeners, I guess, I don't know, it's kind of a bit like granola, but using raw oats or uncooked oats instead of yeah. uh, like the crunchy cooked stuff, if that makes sense. Yeah, it so is it's like, good it's though. Like it sounds raw weird. And nuts <laughs> and bits of fruit and it's basically real food, isn't it? <laughs> exactly. I, I really like it and it, that may sound strange, but it does work. All right. And finally, your favorite um, running or triathlon product. Uh, favorite triathlon product would be a power meter, which you hook into the bike and can give you direct feedback on exactly how much power you're putting out there and gives you really measurable um, numbers on how much your fitness is improving. If it was a favorite running product, I'm, I love the simplicity of just pulling on your running shorts and a pair of shoes in the summer and going out for a run mm -hmm. in the hills. So that would be it for me. That's great. And actually, as you mentioned, uh, Power Meter, I will put a link in the show notes to um, the interview with Jim Vance, who wrote uh, Run With Power. And that was a great interview. So I know some of you are interested in that kind of uh, technological side of training. So you will definitely enjoy that one. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, so do you want to maybe give us just a little bit more information on um, Team Oxygen Addicts, how people can follow you, maybe the uh, best way to get in touch if they are interested in kind of considering this? Sure. So so the greatest hits of it is basically we are an online triathlon team with supportive community of loads of other triathletes who really do lift each other up and try and get the best out of each other. We've got loads of triathlon training plans written for you. So it'll be specific to the event that you're doing and the sort of background you personally come from to address your weaknesses and your strengths and the time that you've got available. And we're basically trying to offer triathlon coaching at less than half the price of what we would offer traditional one-to-one -one coaching, but to give you 99% of the benefits. So our team is only open for two windows every year and the team window opens on the uh, Monday, the 16th of January, and we'll be open through till Monday, the 30th of January. So that's our opening window for this year. And after that, we close the team so we can concentrate on the athletes that are in there and really sort of get to know them and help support you through the athletes, uh, support them through their the season leading up to their big events. We've got several options in terms of payment. We've got a monthly payment option, but we also have a nine month membership and a 12 month membership. And if people join for nine months, they get nine months for the price of seven. If they join for 12 months, they get 12 for the price of nine. So depending on when the race is, there's kind of a big money saving option for them there. And all the details for that, they can just simply check out. If they go to team.oxygenaddict.com, um, and that will have all the, the information there. There's a load of free stuff and downloads on that page. And what we thought we'd do as an offer for the listeners of the Runners Connect um, podcast is 
we've kind of put together a two week sample training plan because we're aware that people are going to want to know what they're going to get before they commit to joining something. So if you go to team.oxygenaddict.com forward slash run to the top, there's a page there where if you enter your email address, what we'll do is we'll set you up a Training Peaks account, which is the online software that we use to deliver our training plans through. So this is a genuine taste of what you will get if you're a member of the team. You'll get a two-week triathlon training plan with the swims, the bikes, and the runs, exactly as it would come from a training plan if you're a member of the team. And there's going to be no charge for that. There's going to be a link there where you can just download it for free rather than the usual charge we give for that for people. And if people like that at the end of it, what they see, then they've got the option to join. And if not, well, it's yours to keep for free anyway. And, you know, with our compliments, thanks very much for checking us out, essentially. But I've loved being on your show. Thank you so much for having me on, Tina. And it sounds like your community and our community are, are so similar. So it's been great talking with you. Yeah, no, I've really enjoyed talking to you. And um, thank you for the, you know, the sample for our listeners. And I really hope you go check that out and, you know, take advantage of this. Because as you've heard today, uh, Rob really knows his stuff. So, um, you know, I think this is a great um, idea for you if you are even remotely considering it and as he mentioned it is only open for two weeks so you only have until the end of the month to uh, check this out so make sure you do that and uh, consider signing up because I think it would be a great thing so Rob thank you so much and um, I look forward to hearing more about it and hopefully if you do decide to sign up um, make sure you let Rob and I know we would love to hear from you that you um, you were listening to this podcast and it gave you that kick to actually you know take the initiative to sign up for one and you have to promise me, Tina, that when you finally decide you're going to enter a triathlon, <laughs> you're going to let me help you. You're oh, a hundred percent. You'll be my first port yeah. of call. I just need you, to. I've uh, got my eye on you. I want ten percent <laughs> of your winnings. <laughs> okay, we can set that deal. That's that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Rob, and uh, I really enjoyed it. So take care and uh, best of luck. Thank you very much. Okay. They don't seem so scary anymore, and I love that Rob was so easy to talk to. I really hope you do take advantage of his free sample plan, even if you don't intend on doing a try right away. It will be something to keep aside and just be that kind of reminder that maybe someday you'll give it a try. And remember, if you're thinking about joining Team Oxygen Addict, you only have till the 30th of January to sign up before they close their doors. So visit the show notes at runnersconnect.net forward slash RC142 for more information and for all the links we talked about today. So next week, we're going to be talking to Michael Hammond. He is the head coach at Runners Connect, and he was also a very successful runner himself in college, and he has a great story. Many of you asked to hear the story behind the coaches, so it's time to meet another of our coaches. So make sure you tune in next week to hear more, and thank you so much for checking us out today. I hope you have a great week. Thanks for listening to the Run to the Top podcast from runnersconnect.net. 